Good morning. Get off of Are my you porch. Shoot me? I will shoot you. Get off of my porch. Can you tell Jackie Lacey that we're here? I don't care who you are. Mm -hmm. Get off of my porch. We'll get off. My philosophy is very simple. When you see something that is not right, not fair, yeah. not just, yeah. say something. Yeah. Do something. Yeah. Get in trouble. Good trouble. Necessary trouble. James Farr, live from Pasadena Media Studios. Get ready for more piercing and provocative. The Conversation Live starts now. And welcome to another episode of The Conversation Live. Conversation Live focuses on social justice, restorative justice, inclusion, and equality. Coming up today, Dr. Melina Abdullah, who is the co-founder of Black Lives Matter Los Angeles, is in the seat today. We're going to have a critical and possibly uncomfortable conversation. I want to catch up with Melina and talk about some good trouble, some good trouble she's been in. Also, we want to talk about her being the keynote speaker for the YWCA Women uh, and Racial Justice Awards coming up this October, as well as I want to catch up with her and discuss Black Lives Matter, defunding the police, just better understand where they are as an organization and where we are as a society. But before we welcome Melina in on the other side, let's watch this first clip. Let's catch up with her. Jackie Lacey's husband has been charged for pulling a gun on Melina. We'll talk to Melina on the other side. We start with developing news. District Attorney Jackie Lacey's husband now faces charges after pointing a gun at protesters on his front porch. NBC 4's Conan Nolan joins us live from our... This is a criminal complaint from the Office of California Attorney General Javier Becerra. It charges David Lacey, the husband of District Attorney Jackie Lacey, with three counts of assault with a firearm. This after an incident on March the 2nd when protesters with Black Lives Matter showed up before dawn at her home. And they were taking video when the DA's husband answered the front door. Good morning. Get off of Are my you porch. Shoot me? I will shoot you. Get off of my porch. Can you tell Jackie Lacey that we're here? I don't care who you are. Mm -hmm. Get off of my porch. We'll get off. Now, the three misdemeanor charges relate to the three protesters to which the gun was pointed, including Melina Abdullah, the co-founder of Black Lives Matter Los Angeles. The group's been demanding Lacey resign from office over what they believe is her failure to hold police officers accountable in questionable shootings. Now, Lacey, at a news conference days later, apologized for the incident and said her husband deeply regretted what had happened, but she said the protesters had crossed a line by threatening and intimidating her. David Lacey's attorney in a statement said he was disappointed with the decision by the state attorney general to file charges quote my client's human instinct is forever and always to protect his wife and his family and to keep them safe from physical harm we look forward to all relevant facts coming to light and jackie lacy is in a tight race for re-election against former san francisco da george gascon and welcome back dr melina abdul how are you doing today I'm great. How are you? I'm doing well. You know, I'm going to cut the formalities and I'm just going to call you Mel. <laughs> Melly Mel. <laughs> You're right. uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this and I remember when it first happened back in March, seeing it and, and some of the white lash and black lash that you caught uh, for choosing to protest uh, at uh, District Attorney Lacey's house. But I also see some irony now that in outside Department of Justice, from the state has decided to step in and and see that this has risen to the level of a crime, which I thought it did in the first place. But I got to ask, Mel, what were you thinking when you went to that door? Well, you know, I'm grateful that we always begin our Black Lives Matter gatherings and protests and demonstrations with spiritual work. So we began with prayer, we poured libations, we did a land acknowledgement, and then we set up the chairs for this community meeting and we walked to the front door to invite her out. Now, we were not expecting, I was not expecting to be met at that door with a gun. But I'm grateful that we have the spiritual practice because what that spiritual practice um, enabled me to do is to get down into my calm self, to allow spirit to take over. And so when he greets us with this gun, 
my response is a kind of chipper good morning you know good morning right it wasn't um fear it wasn't anger it wasn't panic and so i'm grateful to um god and to our ancestors for really covering us in that way yeah i mean because he was a sneeze away from this being a whole different situation i mean right where i, I would be here talking with you that I, I, was inches from my chest, inches I, I, from my chest. I, absolutely i mean i don't understand and, and we'll never know. I mean, he's not speaking publicly, but why, if he felt so threatened? I mean, did, well, first of all, let me back up. Have you or anyone that you're familiar with threatened District Attorney Jackie Lacey or her family? Absolutely not. And she's very familiar with me. Mm -hmm. she, um, you know, she's hugged me numerous times, right, before we had to continue to escalate. We had conversations about having meetings. Mm -hmm. um she's very familiar with me she's not afraid of me and what this was is really an annoyance they were annoyed by our presence mm -hmm. they were agitated by our presence they didn't want us there they were tired of us protesting her mm -hmm. and he allowed that kind of emotion to take over and um you know really dictate some very dangerous and we were in danger you know and so even though you know, my outward um, demeanor was one of calm. Inside, I did think about my three children. And I remember the words in my head, is this really how you're gonna go out, right? I remember thinking that and not wanting that to be how I went out, right? Um, and so they were not fearful. They were annoyed. They were angered by our presence. Anybody who's fearful by something like this, about protests, what would they have done? Like, if somebody came to your door and you were afraid, why'd you open the door? That, right? that, was, that was my question. Why Why open the door? You know, right. if you guys had breached the door, that's different, right? But, right. you know, why not hit the panic button um, or, or, or just simply dial 911? She's the chief law enforcement officer of the county. I'm sure resources would have responded exp right. expeditiously. Yeah. Um, and I just want to name that the doorbell that we rang was a ring system. So I want to name that because anybody who has a ring system knows that she saw exactly who it was on the porch. Okay. They could so, see exactly who it was. So I'm not familiar with the property. I haven't seen it. Is the property gated off? No. It's so you guys, there was nothing for you guys to climb over, breach, crawl under, fly over, right? You just walk straight up to the, to the front door. Straight up the path to her front door, ring the bell. That's yeah. it. And, and your previous attempts to meet with uh, District Attorney Lacey, has she honored that commitment to meet with you guys? No, she's refused to honor that commitment. Um, in December 2017, I actually had a phone conversation with her. And I want to be clear for your viewers that we didn't start by going to Jackie Lacey's house, right? In 2014, in 2015, we called for meetings with her. We had small group meetings with her. They were very cordial, right? Um, we asked her what barriers she faces in prosecuting police. At that time, we were advocating around Ezel Ford, who had been murdered by LAPD. Um, and we asked her what barriers she faced um, and wanted to work with her. We were very deliberate in saying she's a black district attorney. Um, we want to make sure that we treat her um, as if she is kinfolk, right? She refused to um, really kind of work with us in a meaningful way. And so um, we began to write letters, make calls, make different asks of her. And then finally, in October of 2017, the twin sister of Tr uh, Keisha Michael, Trisha Michael, um, said so we got to do more. We got to get these officers who killed my sister prosecuted. And so we delivered a petition. We have been protesting outside of Jackie Lacey's office for almost three years now. And so we don't want people to think we started by going to her house. We started by going out, you know, by talking with her first, by writing letters. What else are we to do? We've been outside her office for almost three years. And this is a response to her refusal to meet with us, but also a response to her refusal to bring justice um, for the 618 people 
who've been killed by police on her watch and the police who she refuses to prosecute. What do you say to people who say that, you know, her home should be her sanctuary? Like you, you, you guys cross the line. Do you think you cross the line? No, absolutely not. And so I think what people are thinking about is their own positions as private citizens, right? When you run for office, you become a public official, which means that you forego that right to privacy. And so again, we are her constituents. We have a right to hold her accountable. And if she refuses to be held accountable in places of business, then what choice do we have? Okay. And it seemed to have some thought it may have backfired, you know, in terms of and helped her when, you know, the 51, 50 plus one percent in the primary. But as the weeks following the election, we kind of saw that number slowly tick down. And now she's in a runoff. Do you think ultimately this will impact her chances of being reelected? Well, it can't help her chances of being reelected, right? Um, if her husband is on trial for a um, violent crime, right? It's a violent crime. It can't help her bid for re-election as the chief law enforcement officer of the county. Okay. Let me check in because I want to switch gears a little bit. You're watching The Conversation Live. The Conversation Live focuses on social justice, restorative justice, inclusion, and equality. My guest today is Dr. Melina Abdullah, who is the co-founder of Black Lives Matter Los Angeles. Uh, Melina has a very storied career uh, in organizing as well as in academia. LA Times has uh, celebrated her and some of the work that uh, she's done. I wanna get your reaction, Melina, about defunding the police, because that's the talk right now. In following the George Floyd murder, the Breonna Taylor murder, and the thousands that we could kind of name drop and go back and forth. But let's take a look at this next clip, Melina, and I'll get your reaction on the other side. If you have been attending have or been watching attending. the last couple of weeks of protests sparked by the death of George Floyd, you may have noticed something. Defund the police! Defund the police! This system of policing has got to go. First, when, when people hear the phrase defund the police, the first thing that they need to know is that this isn't new. Uh, this isn't something that people have just started talking about in the last couple of weeks. I think a lot of protesters, they're getting a taste in the last week or so of the, the sort of violence, the willingness to arrest for any reason and, and no reason at all. And Black communities are saying, welcome to our lives. This is what we've been experiencing for ages. You know, a lot of this is, is baked into decades, if not if not centuries, of this kind of warrior-style training. Although defunding the police seems like a pretty straightforward concept, there's still a spectrum of thought around it. On one end, you have groups that want to defund the police and eventually abolish police departments entirely. And then on the other end, there's people that want to simply cut some money from police budgets and scale back their activities. Regardless, the basic concept is this. Money should be taken away from police departments and reinvested in social services like education, housing, mental health, and alternatives to policing. And that idea has already started to become a reality in many And welcome back. Uh, Melina, the defunding language didn't land well um, with people. Is that what you guys want? I mean, you guys have been called anarchists. I know you but I'm asking these questions so we can get some clarity. You've been called anarchists as a group. You are there to not get in good trouble, but to disrupt, dismantle, destroy. Is that the mission of BLM in its seven year of existence? Uh -oh. Oh. There we go, we got you. <laughs> Unmute. Okay, am I okay now? Okay. Um, I would say that the defund the police language actually hit well for many people. If it hadn't have landed well, it wouldn't be the clarion call of the moment, right? Defund the police might not sit well with our parents' generation. Um, it might not sit well with more conservative voices or forces, um, but defund the police resonates for people in my neighborhood. It resonates for sure with my 
daughter's um, generation of organizers and Gen Xers or Gen, what are they? Gen Zers. They're Zoomers. Zoomers. <laughs> right. It resonates well for them, right? It resonates well for those who understand that policing as we know it is built on slave catching. That's what it descends from. And so when we talk in terms of abolition or in terms of defunding, for many folks, it does resonate. Um, and in fact, it's not until um, kind of the political class began to push back against um, the defund term that we started to hear people say that they didn't like that term. To be clear, we've been saying defund the police for the last five years. And what it is really about is recognizing that our budgets are a statement of our priorities and our morals. In places like Los Angeles and almost every big city, we are spending upwards of 50% of our tax base straight to police. And that's not even including these contracts police have with other units. Mm -hmm. Anytime we show the mayor's pie chart to folks, right, his own pie chart, everyone, conservative, liberal, progressive, radical, young, middle age, old, right? Always goes, that's way too much. Well, but, but doesn't, let me ask you this, Mel, but doesn't less police, less police services, less police funding equate to more crime, increasing crime and officers sure. not being available? No, absolutely not. And in fact, it almost every study that you look at, right? will say that the way in which we create safe communities is by investing on the front end in things like housing, good jobs, mental health resources, after school programs. I'm gonna give you one example. Years ago, the Rand Corporation, which is no bastion of liberalism or progressivism, did a study on youth crime. They found that virtually all youth crime could be eliminated by having quality after school programs from three to 7 p.m. That's it these um, kind of punitive measures like three strikes laws, like trying children as adults, they don't work. What works is services. We know the same thing could be said for, you know, why people engage in property crimes. They engage in property crimes, theft, things like that, because they need things. If we provided those things, we wouldn't have those crimes. And so defund the police is about making sure that when we talk about budgeting, which is absolutely a zero sum game, that we prioritize the things that actually make communities safe. Okay. We just have just a few more minutes and I know you have a tight schedule and uh, we want to kind of power through this, but I, I, I want to ask this because this comes up in the social space. My audience has asked me, I've been engaged in this. Uh, I, I see them as separate issues, but I want to ask you, when we think about the work that BLM has done over the last seven years and what your, what your mission is, why haven't you guys addressed some of the proximity crimes or as other people prefer refer to them as quote black on black crime? Is there um, are there separate issues? Yeah, it cut out your mouth, didn't it? <laughs> you know, they don't ever talk about white on white crime, Asian on Asian crime, brown it's a made up term to make us sound like we are somehow um, immoral, like somehow we are criminals. It's a terrible term, right? I want to be very clear that Black Lives Matter is absolutely committed to doing as much work as we can. And we also understand that we can't do everything. You know, this isn't even my job. I don't even get a paycheck for this. None of us get paychecks for this. Well, right? that's a whole other conversation because some say you've, you've pocketed millions. I know you, right? <laughs> so. I would like to see the millions that they say I've pocketed, but uh -huh. we don't get, um, or, and let me say not they, there are a very, very few who make these allegations about George Soros and all this other stuff, right? It's really important to remember that the reason that we do this work is because we believe it to be our sacred duty. And so what that means is I'm just a mother and just an educator. Jan is just a mother and a bus driver. Baba Keeley should be enjoying his retirement, right? We're doing as much work as we can in terms of black liberation. Um, and we respect the work of groups like uh, the Reverence Project, groups like 
um, second call, right? Who do the work of um, intragroup, ending intragroup violence right, and end, ending crime within the black community, right, which is also connected because some of those crimes could be disrupted if people had what they needed, right? Um, but you don't ask a heart surgeon to operate on your brain and say, why did you not do that? We're heart surgeons. We love brain surgeons, but we are not brain surgeons. Um, and we're only human beings. The more people who step into the movement, the more capacity we'll have. And so people who think we should be doing more, we invite them to come and help us do more. Yeah, I've said to people, you probably have never been to a BLM meeting and understand, um, is there, are you guys exclusionary in the sense that there's no role for black men to participate in leadership, organize, be on the front line, I mean, these are all things, I'm just bringing what's in the social space. People don't even have to come to a meeting, just look at our Instagram. Mm -hmm. If you look at our Instagram, who's speaking, who's organizing, who's leading, we're absolutely, I wanna be clear, we are womanist in our approach. What that means is that we're not gonna do the same things that previous generations did, forcing women to parent privately and then engage publicly. We're saying you get to be all of who you are and coming into the movement. We also don't lift uh, celebrity style leaders, but who's doing the work and who's contributing to Black Lives Matter? We have women and men, right? We have queer folks and straight folks, right? We have cisgender folks and uh, trans folks, right? Doing this work. We want all black people to come do this work because we're not free until all of us are free. So it takes all of us. Men are welcome. We're, you're more than welcome. And if you don't believe us, just look at the work that we're doing. Absolutely. Let me let me switch gears. So we got to cover. We just have three more minutes. I know you got to jump on a, uh, another call. Um, next, coming up in October, you're the keynote speaker at the YWCA's Racial Justice Awards. Let's take a look back from the year that you received the Racial Justice Award. And I want to localize the conversation with just a couple of minutes about what's happening in Pasadena. So Josh, let's roll in this last asset and uh, we'll get Melina's reaction on the other side. But it's a challenge for all of us, whether you identify as black or African or not, it is your sacred duty to stand up. And we're in Pasadena, and I just want you to put down your forks for a moment. Just put down your forks and pause with me just for a moment. Because as we're struggling for our ancestors, we're also struggling for the people whose bodies have been stolen, whose spirits are here. And so I want to call their names. I want to remember that right here in the city of Pasadena, we never got justice for Kendrick McDade. Can we say his name? Kendrick McDade. Say his name. Say his name. Say his name. And over the last couple of weeks, over the last couple of weeks, they've done everything they could to assassinate the spirit, the being of J.R. Thomas. They've said that it was his fault that Pasadena police killed this father of eight with an expected partner. He's the father of nine children who called the police for help. Okay, Melinda, that event is on uh, this upcoming October 19th at 8, 9 a.m. in the morning. I'll put up links for people in the audience to find out how they can support the organization. Um, I'm sure you got a powerful word uh, coming for us. It will be virtual. I'm afraid that I'll have a powerful word by October. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, absolutely. Is there, I mean, I want to be whimsical for just a second, I, optimistic. Do you see this getting better in terms of policing in our communities, uh, and what's the solution? I do see it getting better. The solution is people being in the streets. Don't let folks tell you to go home. It is not time to go home until we get to justice. So as long as our people keep being killed by the police, we need to stay in the streets. And that's the solution. We'll win. Every struggle we've engaged in, we've won. It takes some time sometimes. Um, but we'll win this. And I see us moving forward pretty rapidly right now. Okay. 
you always say it's a beautiful struggle. So, you know, it's, it's and it's always a pleasure to speak with you. I'm going to go ahead and let you go, uh, Melina, because I know you're late for another meeting. And so yeah. Yeah. thank you so much for, for sitting down with us and, and, and talking. And uh, you and I will have to catch up. I'll catch you up on the family stuff later on. Uh, I can't wait to hear what's going on and praying for your family, too. Thank, thank you very much. Again, my guest has been uh, Melina Abdullah. Melina is a uh, co-founder of Black Lives Matter Los Angeles, and uh, she's also a university professor of uh, African-American studies. And uh, she finds herself in a lot of trouble. I think it's good trouble. But before we get out of here, you know, we just am getting through the loss of Congressman John Lewis. And I thought it would be appropriate to let John Lewis's words take us out. So we'll roll this in. I'll check out with you on the other side. The way this young man died, watching the video, it uh, it made me so sad. It was so painful. It made me cry. I kept saying to myself, how many more? How many more young black men will be murdered? that the madness must stop. And it was very moving, very moving to see hundreds and thousands of people from all over America and around the world takes to the streets to speak up, to speak out, to get in what I call good trouble or to get in the way. And because of the action of young and old, black, white, Latino, Asian American and Native American, because people cried and prayed, people would never ever forget what happened and how it happened. And it's my hope that we are on our way to greater change, to respect the dignity and the worth of every human being. And it doesn't matter their color or their background, or whether they're male or female, gay or straight. We would come to that point and say, we're one people, we're one family, we all live in the same house, not just the American house, but the world house. Folks, hope is not necessarily a strategy. You have to follow. Uh, COVID is real. Make sure you wear a mask, Proper uh, practice proper social mitigating, uh, social distancing and mitigating. And until we have another opportunity to speak with you, as always, I want to thank my guest, Dr. Melina, Melina Abdullah. And until we have another opportunity to speak with you, as always, agape.